talking about liberty in America, what we've lost, how we might get it back, and what we can do to make America the kind of country it was meant to be, and the kind of country in which individual liberty reigns supreme over the national interest, where the individual is more important than the President of the United States and the Congress of the United States, and where people are allowed to live their lives as they see best, not as the President or the Congress thinks is best for them. And just before the show, I got an email from Bob out there in cyberspace who says, what can you tell us about how the president has come to gain so much power? And it's very interesting that Bob poses that question about presidential power because on the website, on the radio links page where I post links to articles and websites mentioned on the show, tonight I have featured an article by Llewellyn Rockwell Jr. called Down with the Presidency in which he talks about the power that the presidency has assumed. He begins by saying, quote, The modern institution of the presidency is the primary political evil Americans face and the cause of nearly all our woes. It squanders the national wealth and starts unjust wars against foreign peoples that have never done us any harm. It wrecks our families, tramples on our rights, invades our communities, and spies on our bank accounts. It skews the culture toward decadence and trash. It tells lie after lie. He goes on to say later in the article, quote, Today the president is called the leader of the world's only superpower, the world's indispensable nation, which is reason enough to have the president deposed. A world with any superpower at all is a world where no freedoms are safe. But by invoking this title, the presidency attempts to keep our attention focused on foreign affairs. It is a diversionary tactic designed to keep us from noticing the oppressive rule it imposes right here in the United States. As the presidency assumes ever more power onto itself, it becomes less and less accountable and more and more tyrannical. These days when we say the federal government, what we really mean is the presidency. When we say national priorities, we really mean what the presidency wants. When we say natural, pardon me, when we say national culture, we mean what the presidency funds and imposes. The presidency is presumed to be the embodiment of Rousseau's general will, with far more power than any monarch or head of state in pre-modern societies. The U.S. presidency is the apex of the world's biggest and most powerful government and of the most expansive empire in world history. As such, the presidency represents the opposite of freedom. It is what stands between us and our goal of restoring our ancient rights. Well, the article that Llewellyn Rockwell wrote, in fact, it was a speech he gave way back in 1996 at the John Randolph Club in Arlington, Virginia. It's quite long, but every word of it is worth reading. I strongly recommend that you go to my website, harrybrown.org, go to the Radio Links page, and link to that article and read it. I think you'll find it very, very instructive. What happened, I believe, the way this all came about, is that what our founding fathers tried to create was a government and a society in which people did not have to pay attention to their government, in which the government was so limited and the government was so tied down, so bound down by the chains of the Constitution, as Jefferson put it, that individuals didn't have to care who was in power in the government because the government had so little power that it didn't affect the individual, that the individual American could go about his business, do business with friends, neighbors, and other people, grow his crops, produce his products, whatever he wanted, without any concern about who was in Washington and who was ruling his uh, the country, because there really was so little rule over the country. There was no income tax. There was no Social Security. There were no federal regulatory agencies. There was none of the trappings that we have today. And so Americans became used to the idea of not having to pay attention to the government. And so as a result of that, Americans didn't notice what was happening in the government, as the government acquired more and more power. And when the president made pronouncements, they were taken at face value because those pronouncements were few and far between. We didn't have daily press releases from the White House. We didn't have periodic press conferences hung on every word by the news people in America. And so when the president did make an announcement that the country was in danger or that there was some major problem, people took it seriously. And as a result, when the president said he needed some new power, it was assumed that this was necessary to the defense of the country or to deal with some pressing problem, like what to do with the Indian population or how to handle some particular uh, danger that might be coming from abroad or that Jefferson felt that it was necessary to acquire the Louisiana territories in order to keep them from falling into hostile hands from some foreign government. And then, of course, when the Civil War came along, when the South wanted to secede because it was getting tired of the 
encroachments that were being made, the Southerners having paid much more attention to what was going on in Washington than the average American did, Lincoln was able to seize upon this as an excuse to expand power tremendously and give the federal government power. He even said that the states had no right to secede, even though there had been many secession movements in the United States before, and the founding fathers had said, of course, the states have a right to to secede. If they don't have that right, then they're not free and independent states. And Lincoln went to war, of course, took America into war without a declaration of war, without any kind of constitutional authority whatsoever, on the basis that the southern states had no right to secede. It had nothing to do with slavery at the start of the war. Lincoln himself felt that slavery slavery was an institution that should remain in the United States. And in fact, in his inaugural address, he said that he had no intention of messing with slavery in any way whatsoever. He merely wanted the states to remain in the Union. And when they didn't, he took America into war. And we had the bloodiest war in the history of the country up to that time, and in fact, in many ways, the bloodiest war since then. And of course, after the war was over, some of the powers that Lincoln had a arrogated to himself, the suspension of habeas corpus, the putting in jail of newspaper editors, the locking up of state legislators in Maryland and other places, the imposition of new states like West Virginia, all sorts of things done without any constitutional authority. Some of those powers were rescinded, but many of them remained. And the, at that point, the presidency had already acquired enough power that it could continue encroaching, encroaching, encroaching. And we had big leaps forward with people like William McKinley taking America into the Spanish-American War, Woodrow Wilson taking America into World War I, and in addition, imposing the first income tax, permanent income tax, and the Federal Reserve System. And, of course, then Franklin Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson making huge leaps forward, Richard Nixon making more leaps forward, Ronald Reagan making more leaps forward, Bill Clinton making more leaps forward, and now, of course, George W. Bush going whole hog and wanting to be able to issue subpoenas uh, by the federal government without any judicial authority whatsoever and imposing upon the people receiving those subpoenas a gag order saying that you're not even allowed to tell the press or anyone else that you have been subpoenaed, all sorts of wiretaps, all sorts of intrusions into our bank accounts, our email, and everything else. And we have reached the point that America is no longer the America that the Founding Fathers had in mind, no longer the unique America that was embodied in the Statue of Liberty and gave hope and inspiration to people all over the world that they might, too, either get to America or create in their own countries a similar type of individual liberty and personal responsibility and very, very, very limited government. What we have instead is the same kind of old-world monarchies that existed before. We just don't have the hereditary power yet where a president passes on to his son the presidency when he dies but what we have is the kind of absolute power in washington that existed in all the old world countries the czars the dictators the autocrats the shahs the kings the emperors the kaisers in his article lou rockwell points out that under the articles of confederation which preceded the constitution there was no president there was just a ruling group of five people and they really had very little authority and what they wanted to do had it had to be approved by nine of the 13 states that existed at the time and in a lot of ways the federal government was tied down much more by the articles of confederation of course the history books will tell you that the articles of confederation were not good because the presidency and the congress didn't have the power they needed to run the country and so it was a great thing when the articles of confederation were junked and the constitution was put in its place but there was a large contingent of people among the founding fathers who opposed the Constitution because they thought that it gave the federal government too much power. Patrick Henry, who is, of course, idolized for saying, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death, and whose stirring words are quoted so often in classrooms, he was one of the anti-federalists who was opposed to the idea of the Constitution and wanted to keep the Articles of Confederation. The country was not in particularly bad shape. It was just thought that there were some improvements that were necessary, and so they called what they called a constitutional convention, which was called for the purpose of amending the Articles of Confederation, but instead scrapped the Articles and came up with a whole new constitution. That constitution had to be ratified by nine of the 13 uh, states at the time, the colonies, and during the time that the ratification discussions were going on, there were great arguments and controversy over whether to ratify this new constitution. And the Federalist Papers were written by John Jay, John Adams, and I may be wrong about that. James Madison, John Adams, and Alexander Hamilton wrote the Federalist Papers, which were a series of newspaper articles, essays, that were written anonymously under the pseudonym Publicus. And Hamilton, of course, was very much for a strong federal government. Madison was one of the principal authors of the Constitution, but the Constitution also was based on the the Virginia Constitution, which had been pretty much written by Thomas Jefferson. So the Constitution was finally sold to the 
not necessarily American public, but enough of the state legislators that nine of the states approved the Constitution, and it became the law. And George Washington became the first president. He exercised a certain amount of restraint in the presidency, but, of course, one of the controversial things he did was to send troops to put down the Whiskey Rebellion, in other words, to collect the whiskey tax from people who didn't think they ought to pay any taxes at all to the federal government. Well, there's much, much more to it, but I want to say again that I strongly recommend that you get Lou Rockwell's article. Just go to my website, harrybrown.org, click on the links to articles and websites mentioned on the radio show, and then click on the link down with the presidency and read the article for yourself. I think it is a classic. On my website are dozens and dozens and dozens of articles I've written, and I have only included two articles there, links to two articles in the topical index, links to two articles that I have not written. One is The Invisible Hand is a Gentle Hand by Sharon Harris, and the other is Down with the Presidency by Llewellyn Rockwell. Well, let's go to the telephones now and start with Tim in Knoxville, Tennessee. Good evening, Tim. Yes, uh, is your radio on? Okay. Are you on a cell phone? Yes, I am. Okay, we're having a little trouble hearing you, so you might make it brief. We've got about a minute and a half before we go to the break, so why don't you get us started? Okay, uh, I'll call it to... Uh... In one regard to your comment earlier about the uh, immigration policy that you did not agree with, I disagree under one condition and one condition only. Uh, well, actually, I don't know what I'm saying now. Got confused. <laughs> uh, my thought on that is simply that if we allow open immigration to Mexico and just add one little kicker to that, that being they are treated them just like any other citizen is treated. What they make is taxed allow them to take their money back home with them if they wish and to pay to their families, whatever. As long as they are being taxed, that money's going to go into the American pool. Do not allow them to get on welfare. If they're going to come up here legally or illegally, make them work. Don't supply them with free medical care or anything else. Treat them just like any other citizen. Okay, Tim, we're going to have to go to a break. I think you're listening to a different show from mine because I haven't been discussing yeah. immigration. But in any event, you can hang on if you like. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. I will just simply say what I've said before about immigration, that you can come up with the greatest plan in the world about who should be allowed in and who will not be allowed in, and how that should be handled, that the person who comes in cannot get on welfare or cannot do this or can do that or whatever it is, and it doesn't make any difference what your plans are, because the program isn't going to work anyway. It's not going to work any better than the liberation of Iraq. It's not going to work any better than government health care or government education or, or government anything else. Government simply doesn't work. And you can say we must tighten up the borders and keep out the Mexicans or whoever because they are diluting our culture or whatever. I don't care what you do. They're still going to come in because government doesn't work. It's drug war has not stopped drugs from circulating freely and even more freely in America. It's war on poverty has not done one whit to get rid of poverty in America. It's war on illiteracy has not made America any more literate. And a war on immigration is not going to work any better than anything else. So it isn't a question of whether we should have open or closed borders. We will have open borders because government is incapable of closing the borders. So obviously we should do everything we can to focus our attention on making government so small that if people come into this country, they have one choice, and that is to work for a living and make their way and earn their way by providing services that other people want. And, of course, that should be the same prescription for everybody who was born here. All right, let's talk with Paul in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Good evening, Paul. Good evening, Eric. How are you doing? I'm just fine. What's on your mind tonight? Um, well, if I'm listening to the correct show, a little <laughs> earlier you were mentioning the uh, right of states to secede. Mm -hmm. And you brought up a point that the Founding Fathers even talked about this right to secede. And I was hoping that you could point me to an article or Federalist Papers or something where they where they talked about this. Well, it is in the Federalist Papers, but I'm afraid I can't tell you which numbered article it is in the Federalist Papers. And there were secession movements from the founding of the country right up to the Civil War uh, for a long time. There were a lot of people in New England who wanted to secede from the Union. And that uh, was a big movement in New England. And nobody ever said that they had no right to secede. Some people said they shouldn't secede, that it would be a mistake to secede, that New England was better off in the United States of America. But no one ever used the argument, at least not in public that's been handed down, that the New England states had no right to secede, to secede. And in fact, William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist who was so opposed to slavery, said that the northern states should secede from the Union and leave the Union to the southern states and let them have their slavery. But because of slavery, the northern states ought to secede from the Union because they shouldn't stay in any organization that condones slavery. So this was not something that just popped up in 1860 that suddenly southern states assumed a right to secede that nobody had ever even thought of before. It was a common discussion during the 80 years before that. Was it fair to say that it hadn't been tested before? 
well, it had been tested, but but uh, in the sense that no state had actually decided to secede. This was the first time anybody actually went through with it. But Abraham Lincoln came up with the ridiculous doctrine that the United States of America was antecedent to the states, which is exactly the opposite of the truth. The states created the union. The union did not create the states. Now, when you have a state, the state may create counties, and you can say that the state is antecedent to the counties. But that was not true with the United States of America, that the union itself uh, preceded the states. The states were there, and they joined together, and they decided to make a federation called the United States of America. And there were many states that raised this issue before they ratified the Constitution, that they certainly were not going to join the United States of America if they couldn't change their minds later and secede. Well, does not the uh, Articles of Confederation themselves point to it as a perpetual union, seemingly meaning that uh, you can't break it? That I don't know. I have the Articles of Confederation in my computer, and I'd have to get the document up and take a look at it. But even if it did, it, I don't believe that it would have been meant in the sense that uh, nobody could secede from it. It was The Articles of Confederation were so loose, and the central government was so weak and powerless to impose its way upon the states that I can't imagine that anybody thought that a state couldn't secede. All right. Well, thank you for taking my call. Thank you. If you get any more information about this that contradicts anything that I say, please feel free to call back and call my attention to it. Let's talk now to Kayleen in Fall River, Massachusetts. Good evening, Kayleen. Hello, my esteemed Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, uh, uh, concerning the first email that you read, I can't remember the name of the fellow. Sure. But um, I have three words to say to that. Amen to that, as far as the presidency. Yes. And um, I know this is uh, a little off the base of what you were speaking about earlier in your show, but um, I wanted to make a comment about government regulation uh, versus industry regulation. Um, the other night, I happened to uh, go on to the GAC, JCAHO, which we in the healthcare business call JACO, website, and I've been working in healthcare for well over 20 years, and I always thought that JACO, JCAHO, which is the Joint Commission uh, for Accreditation on Healthcare Organizations, uh, was a government-regulated uh, organization, and I found out that it, it is, in fact, an industry-regulated organization. It is a not-for-profit organization that goes to uh, tens of thousands of healthcare institutions, hospitals, nursing homes, etc., and uh, accredits them uh, based on their, their safety, their records, um, their treatment, etc. And I was very impressed by that. Uh, and it, that is one proof that industry regulation works much better than government regula regulation does. It actually works because I've worked in hospitals for approximately 20 years in nursing homes, even longer than that. Um, and it works because the hospitals and the nursing homes want to meet this, uh, I'm sorry, this industry regulation. In order to be approved by JACO. Exactly, exactly. But, if they, but we must uh, make the point that if they disagree with JACO standards or feel that JACO is corrupt or is taking bribes or anything else, they can simply drop out of it and state their own case directly to their customers, and nobody can come and put them in jail for that, and that's right. what's important. Right, And but my, my point is that you can go to, uh, the uh, for instance, the JACO website and say, okay, this, uh, this facility is JACO approved. So I know that by the industry standard, I would put my grandparent in this nursing home mm -hmm. or I would go to this hospital for treatment because this industry-regulated group has approved this health care facility. And my point is that industry regulation works a lot more than government regulation because, as you've said many times, and I completely agree, government regulation does not work. No, it will always side with whoever has the most political influence. Mm -hmm. And the idea that government should be the referee is ridiculous mm -hmm. because the referee will always side with whoever has the most political influence. Right. And that's why you wind up with ridiculous regulations. You wind up with situations where it is to the great advantage of some people in the industry and the great disadvantage of other people in the industry. And a good example is the FDA. It mm -hmm. costs now approaching a billion dollars to get some kind of life-saving uh, medical drug through the FDA process. Now, what does that mean? Well, for one thing, it makes drugs more expensive. But for another, it means that only the very largest companies can afford to develop new drugs. Mm -hmm. Now, compare that with the computer industry. Apple Computer was created in somebody's garage. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it has provided great pleasure, uh, great productivity, great 
uh, efficiency to thousands and thousands of people in this country. But suppose Apple Computer had to go through a half billion dollar process to get government approval before it could put its computers on the market. We would have never seen uh, Max or any other kind of Apple Computer. So what the FDA regulation does is to limit life-saving drugs to just a few handful of companies that can afford to get through that process. And we, the consumer, are deprived of all of the other companies that might have developed drugs that could today cure Alzheimer's, maybe even cure cancer, cure arthritis, cure all kinds of things because other people are completely shut out of the market. Exactly. And I am all for some types of regulation. However, they should be industry standards, industry standards, not government-regulated standards. Yes. And I believe that if enough corporations got together, and, for instance, Jayco is an example, um, there's, uh, uh, Jayco is comprised of nurses, doctors, administrators, employees, employers. Uh, it's a not-for-profit organization that is not government-regulated whatsoever, and yet most healthcare facilities want to meet Jayco standards because... They want business. They want money. Sure. They want it's to like be a, by it, this industry regulated. Right. It's like having the underwriter's laboratory seal exactly. of approval on your electrical yes. device. Yes. Thank you very much, Kayleen. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate your call. There really are four types of regulation. The first is personal regulation. That means that you simply don't buy something unless you're satisfied that it's safe, that it's efficient, that the cost is within your budget, and that it will do exactly what the seller of the product says it will do. In other words, you don't buy until somebody can prove to you that this is what you really want and need and will get what you expect. The second is what I call consumer regulation, where other consumers are actually doing the regulating for you. Uh, people who are more uh, wealthy than you are, others who do the investigation, and they find out which are the best products. And there are a lot of different ways that this takes place. They make their uh, views known through magazines, through organizations of one sort or another. And in one way or another, you get the benefit of what other people have found out. The third possibility is industry regulation, which is not exactly what Kayleen said, but really the competition between companies that will point out each other's foibles and come in to fill the gaps that are left by other companies. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. You can call us at 1-800-510-TALK. I hurried to, because a break was coming up, to talk about the different types of regulation that exist, and I really think it's important to realize the opportunities that are available to us, that we don't need any kind of government regulation whatsoever, and in fact, government regulation is harmful. And so let me go over that a little bit in a little bit more detail. Uh, you obviously don't want to take a medicine that makes you sick. You don't want to fly in an airplane with a drunken pilot, and you don't want to buy an investment from a crook. And... Anything you do to prevent such things from happening is what we think of as regulation. And your first defense against accepting something dangerous or fraudulent is really what I call personal regulation. You enforce this through your own buying decisions, especially by avoiding various items and situations where you're just simply not sure that you're going to get what's right, what's safe, what, what it is you want. And when you pass up a product or a service, in effect, you're telling the seller that you've tried it once and you were disappointed or that you've heard something bad about it from a source you trust or simply that the seller hasn't convinced you that the product or service is safe, reliable, effective, uh, worth the money to you. In the same way, when you buy a product or a service a second time, you're providing an informal endorsement uh, that encourages the seller to continue offering the features that please you. The second defense against bad products that you have is what I call consumer regulation. This is the total effect of all the buying decisions that you and millions of other consumers make. As you and they make choices, manufacturers and other sellers look for clues about what it is you really want. If safety is a factor in a product or service, the sellers will want to know which safety features are important, how much safety you're willing to pay for, uh, and how to assure you by your standards that what they're offering really is safe. Consumer regulation is, uh, in effect, like a free gift from your neighbors. You might not have a clear understanding of what makes a particular type of product safe or unsafe, uh, effective or ineffective, reliable or unreliable, but many other consumers do, and their decisions to buy or not to buy will push sellers to provide better products to everyone, including you. And one advantage of personal and consumer regulation is that you and others don't have to agree on such questions as which products suit you best or how much safety you're willing to pay for or what risks you're willing to take and what risks you'll avoid at all costs. The variety of suppliers available allow you to buy the product that suits you best while someone else can buy from a different supplier and get what suits him best. You can make your choice and everyone else is free to make his choice. In the same way, you might rely on the advice of a particular expert you believe is the best authority, a magazine, uh, an agency like UL or Better Business Bureau, whoever it is, and you consider this authority to be the best one on the value and safety in a particular type of product while someone else chooses to rely on a different expert. And it could be 
we're regarding a doctor, a scientist, insurance company, consumer testing service, uh, an academic study, a consulting firm, any of these things provide that kind of information of what it is that is safe or unsafe or reliable or unreliable, and you choose what you want, you choose whose opinion you value in making the, uh, in selecting among the available alternatives. The third kind is industry regulation, where one company simply takes advantage of another one's lack of safety or lack of efficiency or lack of service or lack of reliability, and companies, because of competition, uh, simply move in and take advantage whenever any other company is not providing the kind of service that people really want. But then, of course, we come to political regulation by which politicians impose their choices upon you and upon everybody else. Political regulation is saying that you aren't competent to know what's best for you and you're not even competent to choose a source that can help you make decisions. And political regulation says that politicians not only are competent to choose what's best for themselves, but they know what is best for you. And we've been taught since childhood that we need this to force sellers to provide safe products, but the history of regulation demonstrates exactly the opposite. I was talking about regulation and the fact that there are three kinds of what we might call private regulation. That's what you do on your own, what others do for you, and what companies do in competing with each other. And all of these kinds of private regulation are all voluntary. They, nothing is imposed upon you. But, of course, political regulation, the FDA, the SEC, the FCC, all these government agencies impose their way by force, and anybody who doesn't go along with them can go to jail or at least pay huge fines. And let me give you, let's see, let's, let's take four examples of the difference between private regulation and political government regulation. First, private regulation wanted safer cars. People wanted safer cars, so automakers without any prodding from the government whatsoever developed radial tires, safety glass, disc brakes, cruise control, turn signals, seat belts, dozens of other features that make your car much, much safer than cars were 50 years ago. But on the other hand, political regulation has produced such things as mandatory airbags, which killed dozens of little children because it was a misguided step. Private regulation asked for safer ways to smoke because there were a lot of people that wanted to smoke. And so tobacco companies developed filtered cigarettes, low-tar cigarettes, low-nicotine cigarettes, and the companies competed with each other. They advertised their tar and nicotine levels and other safety features, but then along comes the government with political regulation and prohibits such advertising. And so the tobacco companies no longer had any incentive to make their products safer, and they quit trying to make cigarettes safer. A third example Private regulation encouraged pharmaceutical companies to develop beta blockers. Uh, beta blockers reduce the chance of a heart attack by keeping, uh, keeping the blood flowing to and from the heart. But political regulation kept these products off the American market for six long years, even though they, these products were available in other countries with no reported problems whatsoever. The delay caused at least 60,000 people to die prematurely from heart attacks simply because of the government regulation. One last example, private regulation made banks and savings and loans safer because wealthy investors would monitor the safety of these institutions, checking their financial statements and pulling their money out when a, a bank or a savings and loan did something that these wealthy investors considered unsafe. But then political regulation moved in and raised the government insurance level to $100,000 per account. And once that was the case, the wealthy investors no longer had any reason to monitor the institutions, just spread their money around among a bunch of $100,000 accounts. And as a result of that, the managers were now free to make even riskier investments, and that brought on the savings and loan crisis of the early 1980s. So which is better? Which is more helpful? Which is safer for you? Private regulation, whereby competition prods companies to provide the features, the benefits, the safety that are important to you? Or political regulation, whereby politicians force companies to provide the features that are most important to those with the most political influence? And we should never forget that with private regulation, you can change brands at any time. You can accept or reject the claims that companies make according to your own standards. Or if you're not even sure what's right, you can just simply refuse to buy until some company finds a way to prove to you that its product is safe and beneficial. But with political regulation, you can't change regulators. And your choice of products is restricted to just those that the regulators like. Decisions are made by politically motivated people, and they are imposed upon you by force. If you try to buy something the political regulators don't approve of, you can face fines and imprisonment. People have gone to prison for smoking marijuana to relieve nausea or to ease glaucoma symptoms or to keep medicines down on their stomachs when they've got cancer or AIDS or some other disease that causes them to take a whole pile of pills every day, pills that won't stay on the stomach unless they smoke marijuana. People have gone to prison for bringing into America medicines that were recommended by reputable scientists but which have been vetoed by political regulators. That's the difference between private regulation and government regulation. Well, let's move on. Let's talk with Javen in Johnson City, Tennessee. Good evening, Javen. Good evening. How are you? Just fine. What's up? Um, I was wondering the difference between, like, when you buy uh, a product 
how do you know? Like when when you buy it and it's a, and they say it's FDA approved, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> it means somebody with political influence got this by the regulators. That's all that it means, really. And uh, I don't know what uh, further to tell you. It what what regulation does is simply put in the hands of a few people in Washington the power of life or death over any product. And we just assume, because we're taught this in government schools, we just assume that, of course, these people have no self-interest gene whatsoever in their makeup. They are there purely to do what is right, what is scientific, what is medically sound, and so on. But that simply is not true. Presidents appoint people to the FDA or the FCC, in many cases, as a reward for having raised a lot of money in the last political campaign. And some, uh, in most cases, these people have some kind of credentials in the industry, but in any industry, there are different factions, there are different points of view, there are different opinions held, and what happens is some people get appointed with certain opinions, and everybody else's opinion is now outlawed because the people who have appointed, been appointed have the power to put opposing viewpoints in prison for carrying out those viewpoints. And also, uh, if you had to choose a regulation, what would it be out of the ones you, you just... Oh, well, we rely on all three of the private kinds. We, we don't have to choose among them. Uh, what, what happens is that the consumer regulation is going on without our paying any attention to it, meaning that other people are influencing manufacturers to provide safer products, the more serviceable products, longer-lasting products, and so forth, and we just take advantage of that without even thinking about it. But at the same time, competition is going on among different companies who spot gaps in the market where certain companies are not providing the kind of service that they could, not providing the kind of safety that they could, so other companies move in, take advantage of that, and again, that's largely invisible to us unless we make a point of paying attention to it. But in the final analysis, we have our own regulation, and that is to look up the experts that we rely on. Uh, you may take uh, subscribe to computer magazines to decide which of the new computer products coming out will best fill your needs. Or you may be uh, subscribing to gun magazines or magazines dealing with other products. Or you may rely on the various kinds of bureaus that check out these things. Or your insurance company may be providing a certain amount of regulation for you by refusing to insure your house if you don't have certain kinds of products in it that will ward off burglars or ward off fire or whatever it may be. But in the final analysis, you always have the power to say, I'm not satisfied that this is what I really want. I don't believe what they're saying or I'm not sure that what they're saying is right. Therefore, I have the power not to buy, to simply wait until somebody can prove his case to me. So we're really relying on all these forms of private regulation, even as political regulation goes on and gets in our way sometimes. I, I, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. And also... Um what what makes me mad is when you're talking about the political regulation uh, regulations that how people taking the marijuana like you're saying to keep the pills down arrested does that is, does that actually happen typically around here I mean like typically everywhere does it I mean oh yes I mean nobody cares what your reason for this was as a matter of fact let me give you two examples and I'll make them as brief as possible they both happen to happen in California one of them was that the writer Peter McWilliams who wrote a number of best-selling books uh, probably the most famous was one called Taint Nobody's Business What I Do. Um, he had contracted both AIDS and cancer, and he had to take a, a whole lot of medications every day. And although he had never taken drugs in his life, he found that he had to smoke marijuana in order to keep the drugs down on his stomach because yeah. they, they just upset his system so badly that he just vomited them up. And so he started smoking marijuana, and that kept the drugs on his stomach. The feds arrested him, took him to court, and the, they put him in jail, and they finally released him, but on condition that if he uh, was caught smoking marijuana again, he would be hauled back into prison. And he, so he stopped smoking marijuana, and one night they found him dead in his bathroom. He had vomited his pills up, and he had choked on his own vomit. The other example is that that in the state of California, they passed an initiative to legalize medical marijuana. And it was to be done under very careful safeguards, not the kind of thing I'd want. I'd want complete freedom for people to do whatever they decide is best for themselves. But this was a step forward. But the federal government moved in and overruled the state government and said, we don't care what the voters of California decided. We are going to put people in jail. And even one person who was uh, contracted with the state of uh, the city of Oakland to produce marijuana that the city of Oakland would distribute to people who qualified under the medical marijuana law, this person was arrested by the feds. He was hauled into court, and the judge would not allow the defense attorney to even mention that he was growing this marijuana under contract from the city of Oakland. And when the jurors found out about it after declaring them guilty, they were very upset. One thing I haven't mentioned at all in this discussion about regulation is that it runs up the price of everything that we buy, federal regulation does. And it also holds down the wages that we can earn because federal regulation of the workplace causes employers to divert money that would have gone to the employees to complying with these federal regulations. An employer, when he hires somebody, has a certain pool of money that he can afford to spend on that em uh, employee. Now, he has to 
deduct from that what he has to pay into the Social Security Fund for the employee, so that money doesn't go to the employee. And, of course, some of that money has to go to tools or the workplace that the employee uses or whatever it may be. But some of it also has to go to pay uh, to comply with various federal regulatory edicts. And all of this is money that would have gone to the employee. And if you don't think it would have gone to the employee, then you think that employers would never voluntarily give money to an employee and that we would all be working then for the minimum wage. But since we're not working for the minimum wage, obviously there's another factor at work that causes wages to be what they are, and that is competition among employers that tends to push wages up over time to whatever the maximum is that employers can afford to spend on the employees. Javen, did you have any last thoughts or questions? Uh, yeah, before I ask you my last question, uh, I was wondering, I was to you on all the time at 92.7, and ever since, I mean, just now, you, like it went off to something else, and I was wondering if there's another station I could listen to you on. You're in eastern Tennessee. I'm not sure, but if you will go to my website, harrybrown.org, you have a computer? Okay, and just go to the radio page, uh, which there's a link to right at the top of the home page, and you'll find there a link to a list of the stations that carry the show, and there might be another one that you can latch on to there. But if not, you can always listen to the show on the computer and hear the whole two hours then. And all right, thank you. Um, but uh, my last question was about read the regulations. How did they all start? Like, how did they originate? Well, there are always going to be problems in society that don't have immediate solutions to them. And this is an opening for politicians to say, oh, well, obviously the free market isn't solving this problem, therefore government must do it. And, of course, government never does solve any problem, but it gives the politicians the opportunity to say that since the free market can't solve it, we need government to do so. And so in the late 19th century, when there seemed to be problems of, uh, in various industries and in the railroads and so on, uh, this provided an opening for politicians to say, well, we need regulatory agencies to do this. And what happened was the Interstate Commerce Commission, which was the first of these, which was formed to regulate railroads, wound up being a tool of the railroads and allowed the railroads to avoid having to give consumers what they wanted in many cases. And then the next one that followed was the Federal Trade Commission, and that too was dominated by large steel interests, large coal interests, large iron interests, and so on. And these regulatory agencies simply became tools of the industries that they were supposed to regulate. To a certain extent, that's still true today, and it comes and goes uh, depending on who's in office and where the emphasis is and who has the most political influence at any given time. Thanks so much for your call, Javen. Thank you very much. Let's go to Pittsburgh and talk with Rob. Good evening, Rob. Hello, Harry Brown. Yes. Um, I wanted to uh, pick up where we left off last week, and you actually made a point a few minutes ago that serves as a perfect analogy for the point that I was trying to make last week and the point that I tried to complete this week. As you said that medical marijuana law in California is not perfect. It doesn't it doesn't uh, grant people all the freedom that we might want, but it was a step in the right direction. Uh, that's what you were saying a few minutes ago, right? Uh, yes, I did. I didn't say that I necessarily would spend any time trying to promote such a law or to make it come about. I think it is much more important to point out how much federal regulation of the drug business, the uh, recreational drug business, has caused problems, caused problems in law enforcement, caused problems in medicine, caused problems in crime on the streets, uh, all sorts of problems. And I think it's more important to, to keep pushing the point that the government should have no business in drugs whatsoever. Uh, but uh, what I was saying was that the medical marijuana law, of course, was good for some people who wanted to take uh, marijuana to help with their medical problems. Right. Um well, I, I, it's just I'm, I'm just trying to make the point about. Well, you've, I've also heard you say you wouldn't want to trip up somebody who was headed in the same direction that you were headed in. No, I certainly wouldn't argue with anybody who wanted to promote a medical marijuana law. Yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that last week um, I was calling, talking about how I had been doing some reading and I had attended a seminar about tax reform. And we're talking with Rob in Pittsburgh about whether or not certain incremental steps are worth supporting. And, Rob, last week you used the example of supporting the fair tax, which is a plan to replace the income tax with a national sales tax. And the promoters of that have said that they think that when people can see how much they're paying every time they buy something, that this might lead them to reduce government. I don't consider that to be a step in the right direction. And so I not only will not support it, but I would speak out against it because I think that is really a waste of time. It will never come about, for one thing. But also, uh, our object is not to try to change the way of financing big government, but to attack big government itself. And the best way to do that is by showing people exactly how much they could save, how much more money they'd have in their own pocket if they didn't have to put up with big government. And the easiest way to show that is to say, just look at your 1040 return or your weekly pay stub and see how much is going into the income tax right now. And if we got rid of big government, all of that money would be yours. But the national sales tax doesn't provide any kind of help towards getting rid of big government that I can see. Well, um, I agree with at least part of what you're saying. I mean, <laughs> here's the thing. I, I, there's not time here to go into the, all the mechanics of, of these different tax systems and comparing them. I mean, if somebody wants to know more about it, they can look up Americans for fair taxation on the Internet. Um, 
this is basically I've been concerned with tax reform for several years now, at least as far back as probably the ninety sixth presidential election when there was a lot of that's when I first heard about this idea and there was a lot of talk about a flat tax. And I just thought any of these ideas sound like they would be a dramatic improvement over the current system of uh, progressive or graduated income tax. And um, I was a little skeptical about the idea of a national sales tax, but the more I study it, the more, like I say, it wouldn't, it wouldn't solve the problem of big government in and of itself. It's just I think it would be such a dramatic improvement over the current system that I have to, I feel like I'd have to lend at least some support to it as part of the process of moving in the right direction. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be one of these libertarians that's so hung up on that everything has to be perfect that I, I won't even, it's like I won't, I won't compromise on anything to the point where nothing is accomplished. I mean, do you know what I'm saying? Sure, but I don't think that you're going to accomplish anything with the sales tax. How many politicians in Washington will vote to impose a 25% sales tax? Well, all I know is that the bill that has been drafted has 52 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives, and I don't think that a Senate version has been drafted yet. Right, but it doesn't call for a 25% sales tax. That's why they're willing to sponsor it. But as soon as it gets into committee, they will exempt the poor. They will exempt various other favored products, products of industries that have political pull. And in order to replace the amount of money being collected by the income tax, those products that are taxed then will have to be taxed at about 25%. And that's a conservative estimate. It really could be as much as 30 or 35%. It just simply isn't going to happen. So the fact that you're not succeeding with repealing the income tax right now is not, in my view, an argument for trying to succeed with something else that isn't going to take place either. Well, I, what I read is that the, what I think the, the bill that has the 52 co-sponsors now calls for a 23% tax on all pur- purchases of new retail items, which means that wholesale items um, and uh, reused items, none of those things are taxed, and there's no corporate taxes. All the other forms of revenue would be repealed in favor of this uh, consumption tax and uh but, I mean, it would take too long to go into all this. I just, sure. All I'm saying is that once I studied it, I became a lot less skeptical about it. And uh, you know, it's not, to me, it's not the answer to all our problems. It won't get rid of big government completely, but I think it would do it a lot. It won't get rid of it at all. Uh, well, I, here's the thing, though. It would, it would require a lot less in terms of resources that are now being used in the collecting of taxes. And, I mean, the tax code we have now is so insane. It's so big and complicated. And what makes you think that the sales tax wouldn't become a, an enormously complicated thing that would tie retailers up in knots by the time one political faction and another goes to work on it the way they have gone to work on the income tax? Well, it's, it, you see, it's always, we're looking at these things at a distance. We're always saying, wouldn't it be nice if we had this very simple law that would do such and such? But it never <laughs> works that way because these people in Washington are not interested in simple laws that will do what you want sitting in your armchair at home. They're interested in pleasing their political backers. They're interested in punishing the people that are that they don't like and rewarding the people that they do like and every bill that starts out to be a one paragraph statement of something turns into a 75 page uh, diatribe that no congressman reads but votes on anyway that no president reads but signs anyway it just it, it just simply doesn't work that way that you can imagine this perfect kind of thing and get it in Washington well, that's it, a good point and I mean I just thought that if they could not mess with it too much it would uh, it would do a, a lot less uh, as far as hindering economic growth as compared with the current system well, uh, let me make one last statement, and that is in 1986, uh, they passed a tax reform where the 50% maximum rate was reduced to 28%, just two brackets of 15 and 28%. All, most all of the deductions that people had been used to were eliminated, and everything was simple. That was in 1986, 18 years ago, and today you're talking about an, an enormously complicated income tax code. It took only 18 years to get it back to where it was before 1986, and any other tax system that you impose is going to wind up to be the same kind of a tangled mess. The answer is to say we are going to do away with the income tax entirely and we are not going to replace it with anything. We are simply going to get rid of every government program that isn't authorized in the Constitution and that will make it possible that no one will ever have to pay income tax again. That's something that people can understand. They don't need to study. They don't need to wonder about. They can see it clearly. That doesn't mean they'll agree with it the moment they hear about it, but at least it's something that makes sense and provides a benefit that is worth them thinking about it gives them the incentive to care about this uh but to, to go out and sell people on the idea how would you like a 23 percent sales tax well i don't want to pay 23 percent sales tax on everything i buy well you wouldn't have to pay income tax anymore yeah i know but that's another five thousand dollars for a car uh, what's that going to do to the next house i buy what the clothes i buy everything's going to be a quarter more than it was before and so forth i don't must not pay that much in income tax i don't know anyway <laughs> thanks anyway let's go now to sarasota florida and talk with victor good evening victor and my apologies for keeping you waiting so long oh not at all not at all it's a pleasure first of all i i really would like to pay a compliment your eloquent knowledge of the subject that's totally spectacular. Um, well, thank you. Well, yeah, you're very welcome. Look, uh, I'm in America now for almost four years. I lived in the uh, Soviet Union. I was born there. I lived in uh, various other countries in Europe. Uh, I lived in South Africa through apartheid. So I've been around. I've seen the nice of 
been making a careful notes wherever I went, and now I've been in America for a couple of years, and um, I think now I am in a position to say that I have uh, a fairly good impression of what kind of animal America is. And, you know, it scares the hell out of me. My grandmother tried <laughs> to get to America uh, in 1920s. My mother tried in 1953, 54. And now I am uh, with my family, and I have two, two uh, um, very young children that were born here now. And uh, uh, Mr. Brown, I, I ran out of places to run. Yeah, I understand so, exactly how you feel. So I am, I'm sure you do. So I am, I have a visit into this for this country to succeed, trust me. Of course. But, 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 but you know, it scares me out of me to see what's going on in America. It's such a circus. It has become a, such a circus. I, it, it just, my day doesn't pass without some of the other, some of the other uh, act of circus uh, being played out in America. Whether it is in America proper or uh, outside America, but actually, as we said, in the government's interference and uh, uh, the government's, uh, that they help to the big corporations. And here I'd like to mention uh, that the credit bureau, you know, it's uh, such, a, such a perfect pool of extortion that has been given to corporations to, you know, to extort money from, uh, uh, from ordinary people like myself and yourself. It is absolutely pathetic. And, and you know, the, uh, the, the, the things like uh, lessened education and the health care. And, and, and um, I, I, I could write, I, we could write a book about it. And you're absolutely right, but America, I think, right now is in the state of a civil war. I mean, it's not a shooting war yet, but, I mean, it is, there is a civil war going on. Well, you know, then at some point people are going to become fed up and they're not going to uh, stand for having their assets seized. They're not going to stand for having their home seized. They're not going to stand for government intruders uh, listening in on their phone calls and, and monitoring their bank accounts. And uh, th th it could get to that. There's no question about it. It not could get to that, my friend. It's going to get there because, I mean, you know, uh, the, the government can bribe people with this American dream illusion and, and they, you know, uh, or they allow people to have motor cars and positions and be basically so consumed with, they, with, 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 with they, everything Every day, uh, 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 necessity to survive, so they just won't have time to think or to do anything else. Mm -hmm. But time will come when people really, and it's, I can see the level already, 58 million people that live below poverty line. Yes, well, what happens is that slowly but surely it, the government oppression affects more and more people, and eventually you reach the point where there are so many people that the government has gone too far, and, of course, they will never know when to stop, so it will happen that way. All I can say is don't give up hope. I still have hope. I'm not optimistic, but I do have hope because as long as there are people like you or me or the other people listening to this show, then, as E.B. White put it, the contagion can spread. As long as we are speaking about these things, then who knows who's going to hear it, and maybe somebody who really does have the ability to do something about it. So well, please don't give up. Oh. Sorry, uh, but do you know there is such an amount of fear in America? Uh, people are scared to speak out. I mean, this patriotism thing and all that, it reminds me so much of my days in Soviet Union. And people were scared of KGB. I mean, in Russia it was KGB, here it is FBI and everything else. Sure. And people are absolutely scared to speak out. You know, people are really scared. I mean, you, you raise the subject, and they basically duck and dive and, uh, uh, you know, look at their watch, and they must run now. You know, no time to talk, no time to discuss this subject. And, <laughs> yeah, I understand. And, and this is pathetic. I mean, this is really, you know, put sent shivers down my spine. I and mean, it's like I'm giving back to what I ran away from 30 years ago. I know, but at the same time, just surf the Internet a bit, and you'll see a lot of people speaking out, just as you are right this moment. And, and just as I do every week, I am by no means the only person who's talking about these things. And there is a large, large core of people in America who are determined to do something about this. And whether or not they will succeed, no one can say. But there are people speaking up. Victor, thanks so much. I'm glad you're listening to the show. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Call in any time. In these final few minutes, let me take as many emails as I can. Holden in Alabama says, if I may paraphrase you, I support a national sales tax as long as the rate is zero. And he's referring to the fact that I have said many times I support a flat tax, but only so long as the flat rate is zero. Rick in Michigan says, Eric Margolis states in the Toronto Sun, quote, who came down from the mountain to ordain that only the U.S., Russia, Britain, France, China, North Korea, India, and Israel are allowed to possess nuclear weapons or sell nuclear technology? And Rick goes on to say, the U.S. is about to build a new generation of Earth-penetrating nuclear weapons. China and Russia are working on new nuclear systems. India is building a very powerful nuclear arsenal and developing intercontinental missiles. Israel has sold India advanced nuclear warhead and missile technology. Muslim nations, it appears, are the only ones that are not allowed to possess weapons of mass destruction. It really was ridiculous. Even if they found weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, it wouldn't change the fact that Iraq was not threatening the United States, and Iraq having weapons of mass destruction is no more dangerous than Israel having them, or Pakistan having them, or India having them, or China, or Russia. It's always a case of selective indignation. That's what politics is. Eric asks, have you seen the movie Fahrenheit 9-11? That's Michael Moore's new movie. He says, do you think that something like this, which visualizes the contempt of politicians for the average citizen, will have an impact, or will it just be seen as a bush bash? 
Unfortunately, it seems to me the only way to get an idea out to the masses. Could the libertarians use this medium to get their message out? Well, I hope one day soon to be able to tell you about a development in that regard. I am working on a plan to try to get a libertarian national television show on the air. And once we have passed an important step, I will let you know. Daniel also asks uh, if I've seen the movie, which I have not yet, or if I'm planning on seeing it. Well, I don't go to movie theaters much. I think I've been maybe five times in the 18 years that Pamela and I have been married. Uh, Daniel says, I usually wouldn't go to a Michael Moore movie as he's a big government leftist, but I was drawn to his anti-war question the government stance. He really comes down hard on the Bush regime and not enough on Congress for vote, voting to authorize Bush to go to war. Nonetheless, he does slap the Dems on the wrist a little bit. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on the movie. Well, I think it's definitely going to help, and I think that a lot of people who see it who are not necessarily left-wing already are going to see it as calling attention to some valuable points about how America got itself into this crazy situation where we are the world's policemen, the world's only superpower, where everybody in the world is afraid of America and America is afraid of the rest of the world. Jerry in Dubuque says, I read your article about your favorite anti-war movie, and Jerry is referring to uh, an article I put up on the website today about the Americanization of Emily, which is my favorite anti-war movie, and I invite you to read what I have to say about it and perhaps rent the movie from Blockbuster or buy the VHS tape from Amazon because it is a wonderful movie, very entertaining, very funny in places, and it makes a tremendous point about war, and it ends with the most delicious moral dilemma you could ever imagine, a dilemma that is a true moral dilemma because two different principles both of which make sense and both of which are a part of the hero's arsenal come into conflict with each other. And half the people I have uh, known who have seen the movie have said he made the wrong choice at the end of the movie and the other half have said it ended exactly the way it should. Jerry goes on to say another great anti-war movie is South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut. If you're not familiar with it, the U.S. starts a war with Canada because Canada is making movies with bad language and it's corrupting our children. It's a bit crude and offensive, but it makes a great point against war. Well, I haven't seen that. But I have seen Canadian Bacon, which is a good anti-war movie. I've also seen uh, The Second Civil War, and both of those are very funny movies that show politicians for what they are. Well, that music means we got to sign off now, but we'll be back next week. I hope you'll be with me when we are. Have a good week. This is Harry Brown. Good night. <laughs>